So thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here as you're speaking. As you're speaking. Um, and talking about uh, the um, physical parameters of the system. Uh, I also wanted first just to give credit to my collaborators at San Diego State and elsewhere. Um, also, the paper is available at this website. Um, it's also on the uh, on the website. I'm going to be posting an official uh, link. Uh, this is actually the uh, preprint, so this is where you can get the paper for free, as opposed to the official link where you have to pay for it. So, whichever you so choose. Um, so, the organization of this talk, I'm going to first talk about um, binary stars, give some introduction, what binary stars are, how we can get information out of them. Um, then I'll talk about low mass stars in particular, um, and the Kepler mission, what uh, data this, the Kepler telescope provides us. Um, and then finally I'll talk about some results of this one particular system that I spent a lot of time studying, and some of our conclusions. Um, so binary stars, um, basically uh, binary stars are first discovered after the invention of the telescope. Uh, people invented telescopes and one of the first things they started doing with them was they pointed them at the sky and they learned all sorts of interesting things about planets, about stars, uh, about the heavens. And one of the things they noticed when they looked at, you know, at heavens in general is they found stars that were too faint to see. And when they looked at, uh, at stars, often, or not infrequently, they found another star right next to the star that they had seen. Um, and for a while there was some uncertainty. Is this just, there happens to be a star that appears next to it, or are they actually some way physically associated with each other? Um, and it was a question until I said, kept discovering more and more of these, until at some point the astronomer John Mitchell did some statistical analysis and said, well, given the amount of stars we're seeing, and the amount of stars that are close together we're seeing, what are the odds that it's just a coincidence? Um, and he did the math, and it's, you know, a million to one or something. Um, so he realized, okay, that these stars are actually situations where two stars form together or are created together and, and or somehow uh, end up together, they're physically close together, it's not just a random association. There are now four main ways that we identify binary stars. There is visual, astrometric, spectroscopic, and eclipsing binaries. Um, these aren't necessarily differences in the binaries themselves. There are differences in how we discover them. Um, and I'm going to talk about each of them in these briefly, and the last two in more detail. Uh, visual binaries are the most intuitive, and these were the first ones discovered. This is, you point your telescope at a star, and you see that there's actually two stars. Um, these are the ones that, you know, you can see, you know, at night with your own telescope in some cases. Or with more powerful telescopes, you can see a little bit farther away. Um, and you can, if you observe long enough, you can actually even see the stars just orbiting around each other. You can watch them as they move around each other as they orbit. Astrometric binaries are sort of a step uh, back. You can't see both of the stars in this case. But what you can see is you can see one star slowly moving through, moving along a path through the sky. But rather than going in a straight line you, as you would expect, it sort of goes in this wobbling pattern, it goes up and down and up and down. And you can tell, okay, you know, the things in the universe don't just move like that. What, they, what it must be doing is it's orbiting around another star, and the whole system is traveling through space. So you can't, find, you can't see both stars, but you can tell that the second star must exist because of its um, effects on the first star. Uh, so these two methods I talked about, visual and astrometric methods, are great ways of discovering binary stars. But they have some big limitations for being able to find them and for science purposes. Uh, the first one is you need to observe for a really long time. These visual ones, if you want to observe an orbit and you want to understand stuff about the orbit, you need to wait for the entire orbit to happen. Um, so you need to be observing this thing for multiple years. Um, same if it's a long orbit. Same with astrometric. You need to watch it as it moves through space. Also, in order to be able to tell that there's two different stars here, they need to be very close to, to us. Um, if these stars are far away, there's no way, even with the best, tel biggest research telescopes, that we can tell, uh, we can um, uh, see, uh, resolve two different stars that are very, very far away, or that are very faint, or that are very close together. So just for practical purposes, um, these two methods aren't 
uh, a good way. There's many. There are ways of finding many more stars, binary stars, farther away. So the next method is spectroscopy. Um, I wanted to briefly explain what spectroscopy is, because I know there's a wide range of backgrounds here. Uh, so spectroscopy, I just looked up on Google what the definition is, and it says it's the branch of science concerned with the investigation and measurement of spectra produced when matter interacts with or emits electromagnetic radiation. So what does that mean? It basically means that stars, you know, we know that they give off light, and they give off light in a lot of different colors. And you know, you know, everyone, you know, you take a prism and you put it up to sunlight and you get a rainbow. Um, you get these different colors are made up. The, the, the white light is actually made up of these different colors of light, made up of red and green and blues. And also, we now know from you know, modern science that there's also all these other types of electromagnetic radiation that we know exists that we can't observe. There's microwaves and radio waves. So there's all this, so light is made up of all these different colors of light, these different wavelengths of light. Um, and uh, you can, and spectroscopy is the, is the science of studying these different wavelengths and studying the light of all these different wavelengths. So you, you have something like a prism, basically. You look at your light, you divide it into this full spectrum. And one thing that you discover a lot of the time is that there are lines. There are either bright lines in a dark background, or sometimes you'll find dark lines, and I don't have to give an example here. Uh, but there are dark lines in what's otherwise a fairly bright spectrum. <coughs> um, so we'll be talking about these lines a little bit more in just a few slides. Um, just one other further reminder about spectroscopy that's very important for binaries is that when you have a wave <coughs> that's moving towards you or away from you, the wavelength changes. It changes. Um, there's a common sign, you know, physics, high school physics demonstration where you take a whistle and you blow it as you're moving towards or away from you, and you hear the pitch getting higher or lower. Um, similarly, you can do this with um, ambulances as it passes you. You can hear it go from high to low. Um, with light, you get the same thing. If there's a source of light that is moving towards you, the light becomes bluer. And if it is moving away from you, it becomes redder. And this is really important for binary stars. Why? So in binary stars, you have the stars that are orbiting. And one of the stars in the orbit might be moving towards you, and one of them might be moving away from you. So, if if you have stars that are, if if the star is moving towards or away from you, you can see the light that's shifting. So here are two different spectra of the same star. You see these black lines, but they're shifted slightly. Every single one of them is shifted very slightly, either to the red or to the zip. Um, and this has to do with the fact that the star, Castor B, took images. We took spectrographic images at different times. One time the star is moving towards us a little bit, and the other time it is moving away from us a little bit. So, um, in most of the, most cases with stars, when you can see something like this, you can only see one of the stars. You only see one line. You see the line either moving uh, towards us or away from us. But in some cases, what you might see is here there's one line on the top, and then later there are two separate lines. Every single line on the top here separates into two distinct lines. And this is what's called a double-lined uh, binary, because there are two lines. So physically what's going on here, described by this picture, you have two different stars, and at some point you have one star moving away from you, one star moving towards you, just as part of their orbits. Um, and during that phase, you get the lines split. You have one moving away from you, one moving towards you, so it gets split out. Then later on in the orbit, you, they're arranged such that once the, both of the stars are moving perpendicular towards you, you can't see through spectroscopy a perpendicular motion. You can only see what's called a radial motion, a motion towards you or away from you. So in those situations, you get a single line right in the middle. So by seeing something like this, by seeing these lines moving backwards and forwards, you can tell that you have a binary star system. Again, you can't directly observe the second star, but you can infer its existence from the spectrum. Um, just a little bit of uh, physics of what's going on here. Um, when uh, you have two stars orbiting around each other, um, they actually orbit around what's called the center of mass, you know, the area where the two masses are balanced. Just like you know, two kids on a seesaw, um, the center of mass is, is tilted towards the star in this case with more mass, it's larger. Um, so, and, beca and because these two stars, as they orbit around, always keep the center of mass directly in the middle, if you just look at that, you can tell 
this star has to go goes a shorter distance than the smaller star over the course of one orbit. They both orbit around the center of mass, but the larger star moves slower. Um, remember, the speed is what we're measuring by the, the um, spectroscopy. We're seeing, as these lines shift, we're seeing how fast the star is moving towards us or away from us. So by getting the, the velocities of, this, of things, we can get the masses of things. We can get how much mass these stars have. Uh, so double line binaries gives us information about how much mass the star has. Uh, so again, by, this is the same. By looking at basically how high um, this line gets uh, shifted, you can get an idea for how much mass the star has. And if you have the both of the lines, you can get the masses of both of the stars. Um, if you just have one of the lines, you can only get sort of lower limits. Um, you can't get complete information. There's a sort of redundancy in what you're observing. OK, so that is spectroscopic binaries. The final type of binary we'll be talking, um, be talking about today is eclipsing binaries. Um, the first eclipsing binary discovered was Algol in 1783. Uh, John Goodrick discovered that, was observing it, and noticed that every now and then it got significantly dimmer. Uh, two magnitudes dimmer, actually, so quite a bit of uh, significance. Um, and he noticed not only did it get dimmer, I mean, we, they, it was known that some stars would get brighter or dimmer, but that it did it very regularly. Every exactly 68.8 hours, it got dimmer. And he sort of had two ideas of what, there's sort of two ideas of what was going on. One, there's something every you know, he knew it had to do some sort of orbit or circle because it's such a regular repetition. Uh, either there's something moving in front of it every 68 hours, or part of the star itself was dimmer and it rotated once every 68 million hours. Um, and this was actually resolved 100, about 100 years later when they discovered that it was a spectroscopic binary that had this exact same period. So they realized, OK, it must be that these, there's two stars, and one of them is, they're exactly oriented right, that as they orbit, one of them blocks part of the light of the other one. Uh, so here's sort of a, a video of what's going on. You have these two stars, and one of them goes in front of the other one, and the other one does. And for a while, you have the combined light of both of them. So here's the total amount of light you see. And then during the eclipse, it gets down. Um, now, the amount that it gets dimmer is going to depend on a couple of things. It's going to depend on how bright the star is intrinsically, how much brightness there is per surface area. And it's going to depend on how big the star is, how much of the surface it covers. So you'll notice the blue star, or when the blue star gets blocked, there's a bigger dip than when the red star gets blocked. Blue stars are hotter, are brighter, per amount of surface area they have. So when you block out part of the blue star, it causes a bigger dip of the light. So you have a lot of different factors going on. But it also depends on how big the star is and how much of the, uh, the light you're covering. So the amount of the dip and how long this dip takes is related to how big the stars are. So spectroscopic binaries told us how much mass the stars have. This these eclipsing binaries will tell us how big the stars are, what they're reading like. Uh, and what, basically the way it works is, is, is you know, similar to uh, you know, solar eclipses, you have first, second, third, and fourth contacts. Um, and the time for these different contacts, uh, so, let me start over again. Um, so the time from when you go from here goes to here is going to, this, this time between T1 and T2 is going to be directly related to the radius of the solar star. Likewise, the time from T2 to T3 is going to be directly related, directly proportional to the size of the larger star, because it's literally how long it takes to travel across the, um, the star. So by looking at the ratios of these times, you get information about the ratio of the radii. Uh, so you're starting to gain more information about both of these two individual stars. So. Um, from basic, so, so, so the key thing here is that binary stars are our best way of getting very accurate measurements of the masses of stars and the radii of stars. This is how we know what, how big stars are. You know, if somebody tells you that you know, blue stars are the really massive, really large ones, and you ask how do they know, the answer is they find a blue star that's a main sequence star, 
and that's in a binary, in a binary system, and they do these measurements, and then they see the other stars that look similar to it are similar to this one that is well characterized. Um, somewhat surprisingly, there's only a few, the, the number of these systems that are known and are well studied and we have really good numbers for is in the hundreds. Um, everything that we know, you know, we have the main sequence about stars um, is mostly from a few hundred of these double line eclipsing binaries um, that we can get this information from. Um, eclipsing binaries have, um, but part of the reason for this is it's very hard to find um, eclipsing binaries. Uh, you need both of the stars to be roughly uh, the same luminosity, the same brightness. If one of them is really, really bright and one of them is really dim, you're not going to be able to see both of the lines from both stars. You're only going to see the bright star, and you can't do the spectroscopic uh, things. Um, you need to be able to look at them um, for a fairly long time, because you need to see this whole eclipse happening. Um, so if the stars are far apart and are orbiting slowly, you have to observe for a very long time. And they have to be oriented exactly right. You, for an eclipsing uh, binary, it has to be exactly oriented right. It, have, it just randomly is oriented in a different way relative to our perspective. We will never see eclipses, even if it is a binary star. Um, so, like, so there's only a few hundred of these. Um, one nice thing about binary stars is we can you can do some math about what are the odds that these two stars formed somewhere else and just happen to come together and be a binary, and the odds are basically zero. So the only way you get stars like this is if they form together. Um, stars form in clouds, and the two and two stars sometimes form close together and just stay bound together. And that's pretty much the only way, significant way, that you get binary stars. So these two stars not only are the same, you know, can you get all this information about them, you can also say that they're the same age, so you can compare them to each other. Okay. So this is how we observationally know stuff about stars. This is how we know about their masses, about their radium. Um, but we can also do observational um, things about other parameters of stars. Uh, everyone here should know that you can go out and look at a star and see how bright it is, or see what color it is. Um, and with telescopes, we can, um, by seeing what color it is, you can actually tell what temperature it is. Um, just basic uh, physics of hot glowing objects is that the redder the object, the star is, the colder it is, the bluer it is, the hotter it is. So you can just go out and look at a whole bunch of stars, figure out how bright they are, figure out what their temperature is, and form what's called an HR diagram, Hertz von Russell diagram, um, sometimes also called a color magnitude uh, plot. Um, and you discover that most of these stars form, fall on the certain line. You can also take a computer, uh, plug in a whole bunch of, uh, do a whole bunch of calculations involving uh, four basic equations, hydrostatic equilibrium, thermodynamics, um, heat and energy transfers, and say, for a star with a given mass, how much, what, you know, and sort of do a whole bunch of calculations. Given what we know about physics, what temperature should that star be, and what brightness should that star have? So you can do this theoretical um, modeling, and you can then compare your results. Do your theoretical models match what you're actually observing? Um, this is always a huge thing in science. Can you, you know, do we understand our theory right? Well, does our theory make predictions, and can we compare it with actual observations? And for the most part, it works. Um, for stars uh, similar to our sun, or actually larger than our sun as well, it works. So here is a plot of either the mass and the radius of the star, or the temperature and the radius of the star. Um, and these points are some uh, sample stars, and these solid lines here are theoretical models. And you'll see, yeah, these are some pretty good fits. Okay, this model down here does work. But these other two seem to work pretty dang well. Um, so that's great. Um, this tells us, you know, this makes us very happy. Then we look at some of the lower mass stars. And you get a plot like this. So here's, again, mass versus radius. And here's, we have a couple of different models here, but in all, in most of them, there's a whole bunch of stars that just do not fit. They're all, and, and not even just randomly scattered, they're all consistently too high a radius for the amount of mass that we observe. Um, and um, 
the new such stars that are between about 0.3 and 0.8 times the mass of our sun. Um, and this is a serious problem. It means either there's something wrong with our theoretical understanding, or there's a problem with our observations. But these are both fairly straightforward um, calculations. The theoretical ones are a little bit harder. Um, so yeah, so the, the, um, these errors are somewhere between 5 to 25 percent, which you know you can do the calculations, OK, what are our uncertainties in our observations? What are our uncertainties in our models? And they're nowhere near 5 to 25 percent. We think we should we have the answer a lot better than what we apparently did. So what's going on? Well, there have been some studies a few years ago where they found a couple other systems, and they have a little bit less of a disagreement, but it's still too high. Um, there was also this note, this discovery uh, uh, five, six years ago, that these models do predict the luminosity, the brightness of the star, given its mass. They're just getting the radius wrong. <clears throat> so the brightness of a star fundamentally depends on what's going on in the center of the star. It fundamentally depends on how much energy is that star producing. If the, if the star is producing a certain amount of energy, and it's not either exploding or collapsing, it has to be radiating the exact same amount of energy. So what this tells us, the fact that we're getting the, uh, the luminosity right, tells us that our models are predicting correctly and understanding correctly what's going on in the center of the star. We're just getting something wrong about the atmosphere. Um, somehow the, the star is getting colder but bigger, so it gives off the same amount of total light. Um, but we don't know why. So there's actually um, uh, some ideas. So, so um, one, one, one explanation is, well, maybe the stars that we're looking at, the low-mass, double-lined, eclipsing binary stars that we can look at, aren't a representative sample. Remember, there's only about 15 of them, as of, this is as of 2005, but even since then, only a few more had come out before my own paper, um, of these, these stars. Maybe there's something about these stars that we can observe that is systematically biased. Um, that we're not getting the normal uh, uh, no normal stars. There's some, we're looking at weird stars. Um, and that's why we're not getting our, our systems match up. And there's some argument for this, mostly that it's really hard to find uh, low mass double line eclipsing binaries. Um, double line eclipsing binaries are inherently hard to find, and low mass stars are inherently hard to discover. Low mass stars are smaller, they're dimmer, they're redder, they give off a lot less light. So you need really, really good telescopes to see them. You can see them. We, with, our best help, with our best telescopes, we can see these low mass stars. But it's a really time consuming process to, to find binaries. The easiest way to do it is you stare at the star for a really long time and you look for that eclipse. But if you're looking for an eclipse, you need to watch for an entire period of, of the orbit. Um, so if the orbit takes a year and a half, to see it, you need to see at least two eclipses. You need to be staring at this low-mass star continuously for about three years. And so, somewhat shockingly, um, there's not a huge amount of interest in sending our biggest telescopes and having them point at a small star for three years straight. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> astronomers think that you know there's other stuff that they should look at also. I don't know why. Um, so, so it's hard to find. So, so it's hard, to, even though it's theoretically possible to see these it's hard to get the resources available to find these things. Um, so the thought is, well, maybe there's something. So, so the ones that we do see are the ones that have very short periods. The other ones, you know, they orbit maybe every few days. So you only need to observe it for two weeks. That might be possible every now and then, um, or even less time. Or, and you, know, you might just sort of happen to see it through either amateur astronomers or through other research projects. You see a star getting dimmer you're a lot more likely to see one that has a period of three days than one that the eclipse happens once every two years. <laughs> um, so maybe there's something about stars that are really close together that are different from most stars. Um, the exact physical process is not uh, clear. Um, and in my paper, I not a, didn't go into the, I didn't want to try and um, argue for some theory that is not um, incredibly well understood. The, Basic model, basic concept, or one basic uh, concept, is when two stars are really close together, they start having tidal forces um, that cause them to spin at the same rate that they're orbiting. 
Um, so the tides on Earth are caused by you know, the moon orbiting around the Earth, causing water to flow. Um, and this force actually slows down the, or the spin of the Earth. You may have heard that you know, in the age of the dinosaurs or whatever, the Earth had a 22-hour day, and it's now 24. The, uh, the, the, the orbits are actually changing um, the spin of the Earth. So two stars that are very close together um, will, over time, uh, have their orbits change such that they, both, they orbit at the exact same speed as they spin. They spin at the same speed that they orbit. So if they have an orbit that lasts for three days, that lasts for three hours, uh, they complete one orbit in three hours, they will also make a complete spin in three hours. So these stars that are very close together will actually end up spinning very, very quickly. And possibly this high rotation causes magnetic fields. We know that rotation on the sun causes magnetic fields and star spots on the sun. So you get these dark splotches on the sun, um, which you can observe with a solar telescope or whatever. So maybe these stars have tons and tons of spots such that most of the surface of the star is actually a sunspot. Well, sunspots are a little bit colder and a little bit dimmer. If most of the star is a sunspot, it's going to be a little bit colder. And in order to be in balance with the core, it needs to get bigger to give off the same amount of light. So maybe that's what's going on. Maybe something else is going on. Yeah? I've heard that sunspots are seen as dark in relation to the rest of the star, so if, if the whole star is a sunspot, would that mean that we're seeing the star as completely um, less bright? Yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's actually a really good point. Yes, the sun, if, if you were to just look at the sunspot, you know, you tell you had your telescope just looking at that sunspot and not looking at the rest of it, it would still be incredibly bright, um, because it's incredibly hot. It's just dim relative to the rest of the star. Um, so in this case, actually, so, so these stars, um, it wouldn't be that the whole thing is one uniform spot. It would have some spots that it, it, quite a significant portion of, this, of the surface, 50%, 80% of it, might be sunspots. It might actually have spots that are brighter rather than spots that are darker, essentially. Um, like I said, the exact, the exact physics of it is actually really complicated. Um, and our paper didn't try to analyze it exactly what was going on. We just argued that maybe it's something like this. Um, but that's a good point. So, so there's something going on um, in these really close binaries. So the idea is, well, it, here's our theory. Our theory is that the problem is that we're only looking at binaries that are really, really close together. We're only looking at low mass stars that are really close together. And that's the problem. So there's a very simple test of our theory, which is, well, look at stars that aren't close together and then see if they match our models. The problem, as I mentioned, is that it's very hard to find uh, low mass uh, binaries that are very far apart. Um, that conventional ground-based telescopes just don't have the inclination or the uh, time to be able to find these things. That's where the Kepler mission comes in. So the Kepler mission is the space telescope that, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, was designed to look for planets. Um, and it actually looks for planets similar to the way we look for binaries. It looks for eclipses. It looks for a planet moving in front of the star and seeing a tiny dip, a tiny dip in the brightness of the star. I'm going from you know, really, really bright to very slightly less bright. Um, the Kepler uh, satellite uh, it, it has a resolution such that um, if it was pointed at Earth rather than where it is in space, it could see the difference in light from Earth of you turning off and on your porch light. Um, so this incredibly sensitive thing. And it's staring at 150,000 stars continuously. Because again, you have the same problem as you do with binaries, is that you want to look for a star, you know, you want, Kepler is actually trying to look for a planet like Earth orbiting a star like the Sun. Which means the Earth orbits once a year, so you need to observe continuously for over a year to be able to see something like Earth. No matter how good your telescope is, if you're using this method, you need to observe continuously. So rather than looking at different stars, they picked 150,000 stars that are all in the same patch of the sky, and they just stare at them continuously. So the main people are trying to find planets on this thing, but all of the data is being released um, to, the, to the scientific community, and it's actually also available to the general public. Uh, you can go to NASA's website uh, and look for Kepler data and 
the, a lot of the data is just available there for free for anybody to um, use and do whatever you want. So I encourage you to do it. It's not pretty pictures, um, but uh, <laughs> it is real scientific data, so it's cool in that way. Um, so, so, it's, so it's been looking at these 150,000 stars, and PERSA et al. in 2011, uh, they, they did a lot of initial pre-processing to find out what stars they found. Um, and they identified 1,800 binary stars in the catalog. Um, and it was very, very high precision. Um, of these 1,800, a few dozen of them were uh, low-mass stars that looked interesting for our research. Um, and um, and uh, so there's a few dozen of them that uh, look interesting. So first, I just wanted to just show you the data uh, that you get from that. So this is a sort of standard thing. Uh, you have time on this axis here, and then brightness on the, the y-axis here. So here's an eclipsing binary with spots. So this, the eclipsing binary is this brief, this big dip in length. It's very brief, uh, but very significant. Uh, with a planet, the dip would be much, much smaller. It would be you know, maybe that high or whatever. So if you need much, it's much harder to find, but you can still see it. But these binaries, you know, a star is much bigger than a planet. They're actually very easy to detect with something like that. Um, and then the spots are just sort of this sort of random up and down motion that's going on along this continuum. Here's examples without spots. You see it's almost completely smooth. So that's not observational noise. That's what the star is actually doing. Um, and it's because as the sun is, is, is turning, some spots are coming into view, some are coming out. So when there's spots, it's basically very chaotic. We can't even perfectly model what's going on. Without it, it's nice and clear. Okay, so uh, so we found uh, nine now. We've got already nine possible low mass binaries, um, and we did some ground based follow up. At, uh, I was doing this at San Diego State. So San Diego has a uh, observatory at Mount Laguna. It's a 0.6 meter, and they also have a one meter telescope. Um, and some of my uh, uh, collaborators did most of this ground based work. Um, and they looked at it and they found that one of the stars was a triple, which we immediately described because triples are a pain and we didn't want to have to deal with it, uh, so we got rid of it. Um, two of them were only single lined, uh, that, so you could only see one of the stars, but one of them looked really good. Um, a couple of them also looked positively good and we decided to postpone them for a future one. Um, but this one, 6131659 is the most, uh, this sort of seemed perfect, so we decided to go with that one. Um, Okay, so earlier I talked about how the way you find the mass and the radius of these of stars is by looking at double line eclipsing binaries. And between this two information, you get masses and radii. That was a little bit of a simplification. Um, between those two things, you get a lot of information about the masses and radii. And if you happen to know that the system is perfectly inclined against you and is a perfectly circular orbit, there's no eccentricity, you can by hand, you know, with pencil or paper and a little bit of work, calculate out the exact masses and radii of the two stars. If there is any deviation from this perfect orientation, you can't do it by hand. You can still get the you can still sort of get the answer, but there's no way of doing it numerically, calculating it out. What you can do though is, for any given inclination of the system, you can figure out what you should see. Um, let me actually first of all explain what, so the inclination is, you know, in, you know, when you see pictures of the solar system, the orbits usually look pretty close to circles. But all, most orbits are actually very slightly different from uh, circles. They're ellipses, um, as Kepler discovered several hundred years ago, uh, the astronomer, not the space telescope. Um, and also, you know, orbits can't, are not necessarily directly on this plane. There's, all, there's a couple of different angles uh, that, relative to our point of view, um, it could be angled this way, or it could be angled this way, slightly to us. And you have to talk, you have to correct for all of that if you want to figure out what you're observing. Because remember, the only motion we're seeing is radial motion towards us or away from us. So if it's inclined a little bit, some of the motion towards us or away from us is actually being lost when the motion is going up or down that we can't see, or going side to side that we can't see. Um, so you're losing a little bit of the velocity, and you can't tell how much easily. What you can do is you can say, well, if I know what this angle is, and I know what the eccentricity is, and I know what the mass of the star is, I know what the radius of the star is, 
what light curve should I observe? And that's actually something fairly easy to calculate with the computer. And then you want to say, okay, so I can make a prediction in one direction, but that's not what I'm feeling. I, I, can't, I can't just guess what the correct mass and radius and inclination is. What I can do, what I, what I, the information I have is what I actually observe. And I want to get the answers. So there's this code, this computer code called ELC, that's several hundred thousand lines of code in Fortran. That was developed 20 years ago by one of my collaborators. Um, that basically it does, it, it's designed for this problem. And what it does is, it has two parts. The first part is given orbital inclinations, masses, radii, etc., etc., etc. It tells you exactly what type of light curve you should expect to see. So, okay, so this is the, the, the code that's talking about. It goes in the, in the wrong direction that you want. And then the second half of the code is something that is called machine learning, which is basically where you try to get the computer to do all the hard work for you. The basic idea is you tell the computer, okay, start guessing. Guess masses, guess radii, guess inclinations, guess eccentricities, and see how close you are. Do this, you know, a thousand times. Find which ones are the closest. It's probably something like that. Now guess some more close to the ones that got pretty close to what you actually observed. Then do this again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And you just keep getting closer and closer to the right answer. Um, so in practical terms, the way this works is you spend an hour or so setting up this program, uh, and you tell it the ranges that you think your answers are in, and then you tell the computer to run, and then you wait three days. And then you go back to the computer and you say, oh, how close did you get? And then you discover, oh, it's got, it's screwed up and it's nowhere near, and you messed up one thing. And you go and you correct that and then you tell it to run for three days again. Um, so it's a, still a somewhat time consuming process, but you don't have to make all the 100,000 calculations and guesses yourself. Um, so it's at least doable as opposed to completely impractical. Um, but through, there's a number of different um, machine learning algorithms that they use, genetic um, algorithms, I can talk about it a little bit more afterwards if people have specific questions. Um, but we sort of gloss over this as not particularly astronomy related. Um, and eventually you sort of converge onto um, your answer. Okay, so sort of going actually a little bit back in time. Um, the part, uh, there's a couple of other steps you need to do in this uh, process before you can feed your uh, stuff into ELC. Um, First, uh, the data from Kepler is, has trends in it. It can sometimes just consistently start to drift. Um, Kepler is a telescope, just like ground-based telescopes, and it has all sorts of problems. Uh, sometimes a uh, pixel gets hit by a cosmic ray and starts giving off different values than it did earlier. Um, sometimes, just as the telescope is sitting out in space, it heats up or cools down. And as the telescope gets hotter or colder, the pixels in the camera get slightly more or less sensitive. So everything appears to get brighter or dimmer. It's not that the star is inherently getting brighter or dimmer, it's that the telescope is. Also, in order for the telescope to work, it needs to have its solar panels pointing towards the sun for energy. Um, but it's trailing the Earth, which means that every four months or so, the sun is in a fairly different point relative to the telescope. So the whole telescope rotates which is fine, except now you have a different pixel that's looking at the star than you were earlier. And one pixel is not the same as the other. So you get these jumps from here to here. Again, the star didn't abruptly get brighter there. The telescope rotated, and you're looking at the star differently. Um, so you need to sort of correct for all of this stuff. Um, the other thing you then do is then divide. So ideally, uh, with a lot of these things, this Kepler has been observing for several years now. Uh, so we may have multiple different observations. So we divide these observations basically and treat each eclipse as a completely separate um, research topic. And look at them each individually, get answers that way, and then you can compare all the answers and you basically have an uncertainty because you've made the experiment, you've done the experiment 12 times. Um, now you can start using statistics and getting uncertainties in your answers rather than just an answer that you're not sure how fair it is. Uh, so I'm going to sort of skip over that. Um, so at the end, after you've run ELC for some time, you get all these answers. So here is, you get this big long chart full of all sorts of things that you do or don't care about. 
uh, you get inclination, velocities, you get some arbitrary start time, you get the temperatures of the different stars. Um, in this case, there is actually, uh, we discovered that there was a third star somewhere in the background that isn't related to the system, but ELC actually has a way of correcting for it, where it puts in that there's a third star of some temperature that's just a constant amount of light in the background that it tracks off. Um, so, it gets, so that's this T3 here. Um, and the, the stuff that we're most interested in, mass and radii of these two stars, uh, M1, M2, R1, R2. So just other results, you know, we discovered that it's very, very close to a perfectly circular orbit, but slightly off, very close to zero inclination, but again, very slightly off. Um, the very close to zero inclination is not surprising, because if it's not very close to zero inclination, it's not going to be that time. Um, and the very close to zero eccentricity is also something that's expected in binary stars. The, uh, again, the sort of tidal forces going on tend to result in circular light orbits. Um, but these very slight differences actually make it impossible to solve and eliminate, even though there are numbers that are very close to zero. Um, we get very good results for our um, masses and radii as well. So again, here is this, here's the result. This is basically a thought that ELC makes, where the solid line is ELC's best guess for what you should observe. And the dots here are what you actually observe. And then down here, you get basically the error. And then again, here's the error. Here is the, the red line is the uh, prediction and the dots that you can't even really see because they're right on top of it are what you actually observe from these existences. So incredibly good fit. Um, where this is really you know, a thought like this is when you say, yeah, okay, we got it. Um, and okay, so but okay, so we have masses radii. Do they fit with our theoretical models? So here's that same chart that I showed you earlier. Uh, these four different models um, and. Uh, this observed stars, all of them, almost pretty much all of these consistently too high. And here's that same chart with our two stars. And as you can see, they're pretty much perfectly along one of these models. Um, so this was a huge, and, and none of, they're both on the same model. So these different models, by the way, are different ages of the stars. Um, as stars age, they slightly change. Um, so one of the problems was even in some cases where you could get one star that was on the model, the other star wouldn't have been on that same model. So ours perfectly fit on the same model. Again, here, this is mass and temperature. They both pretty much fit on this dotted line within our uncertainty. Um, so this was a huge finding. Basically, we showed that, yes, you know, our, so our prediction was that if you find binaries that are far away from each other, they're going to um, they're going to fit a model. We found this binary; it's far away. From, they're far away from each other, and it fits the model. Um, there is so, so our confusion is that seems to be some, there's, what's going on with this discrepancy is that uh, low mass stars that are close together have something weird about them. Um, and that's why we have problems. Uh, future work: there's a couple other uh, systems uh, with Kepler that have. Um, some that are a little bit harder to do, but could also we could do the same thing. Um, we also, as um, time has passed, Kepler's continuously observing. Uh, we have another full year of data. We can add that into our existing one and drive our uncertainties down even further, rather than 12 eclipses. We have 20 some at this point. Um, also, uh, we can look at sort of activity level. Um, and then there's a lot, now that we've shown that this is a fruitful line of research, um, people with more theoretical events can start looking at magnetic fields and say, okay, we know that this is what's causing it, exactly what's going on and how are they causing it in, in detail rather than just sort of question marks in the middle. So I want to thank, first of all, thank all of my collaborators who worked with me on uh, doing this uh, crop research project. Uh, also thanks to the National Science Foundation for research grants and funding. Uh, thanks to the Kepler Guest Observer Program and the Kepler Science Team for their uh, for their data, which, like I said, they made publicly available. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming and the uh, association for hosting me. Um, and yeah. <laughs>
a few questions. So, do you does ELC automatically calculate what the leak darkening on, yes. the, on the stars is? It, ELC is that consistent with one of the uh, intended models? Yes, e ELC has a number of things to deal with uh, uh, complications. So one of the uh, complications, as you mentioned, is them darkening, which is that when you look at a star, the center part of the star is brighter than the edges, basically due to how deep into the star you are seeing. Um, stars are gas, so you can't see, there is no distinct surface. The surface is basically how far you can see before you're likely to hit an atom. And when you're looking directly at the middle, you see deeper into the center of the star, so you see hotter stuff, so it's brighter. Um, so, yes, ELC, one of the things that it has to correct for is that as the eclipse is starting to happen, the early part of the eclipse, you're blocking the limbs, the edges, so it's not as much of a um, brightness. The ELC actually automatically corrects for that. Um, it has a lot of things that it can automatically correct for. Actually, um, he, it, but the, the, the guy I work with, uh, uh, Jerry, um, who is the one who primarily writes and maintains this code, um, it, it also continuously updates it. Um, for Kepler, actually, we had sufficient precision um, that he had to make corrections for the fact that there are general relativistic effects to the orbit, um, that the orbit isn't perfectly Keplerian. There are general relativity says orbits are going to be slightly different than what Isaac Newton says they are. And, this, and Kepler's data is sufficiently precise to be able to start getting this as an error that you couldn't figure out how to correct for until you realize that there are um, relativistic effects for it. Um, do you have any questions? Are the uh, uh, apparent sizes of the relative uh, binaries uh, comparable to the sunspot size? Um, not sure. I can see, I can imagine if you have an eclipse which, uh, in which one of the bodies coincides with a sunspot that's on the hidden oh, object, right. you get superposition of contradictory information. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why we were looking for stars that didn't show evidence of sunspot activity, because you do get some uncertainty if you have eclipses going on during sunspots. Um, the ELC actually does have some sort of very basic way of modeling sunspots. They can basically put one or two darker circles somewhere on the star and have them rotate in circles. So obviously it's an approximation, but it sort of gets something done. But for this case, uh, we actually tried that model, and it basically said it didn't find any evidence of this. And again, looking at uh, you know, here, you, the, you know, when, you, when, you, when you just look at it by eye, you can basically see if there, are, if there are significant sunspot activity or not. And we can just tell that in this case, there wasn't. You mentioned earlier about the energy flow from the core reaction to the surface temperature. Mm -hmm. But uh, when stars are going through a transition, you know, if there's an incipient event uh, initiated in the core, it may be several hundred thousand years or a million years even before that, that effect occurs on the surface. Can that affect the diameter or temperature? It relation? could, but we're looking at main sequence stars and we're looking at low mass stuff. Mm -hmm. mass so sequence so stars. none of them are in incipient? Yeah. yeah, basically they're all pretty completely stable. So. Does ELC take into account that the star may have certain kinds of materials in it, like may have uh, metals in it, or um, so uh, not directly? Um, it, it, so ELC is just um, it, it's just modeling the total amount of brightness. In general, the amount of metals aren't going to change the things we're observing because we're not looking at specific spectral lines. We're looking at the total amount of brightness. Um, the spectral line stuff that we looked at was uh, for the spectroscopy um, was done with ground based stuff rather than the Kepler uh, telescope. Um, and exactly which lines are there doesn't really matter. We're just want to be interested in how much overall they show. Um, so it's not something that's. Um, it, it, there will be slight changes that if you have more metals or less metals, it will slightly change the uh, brightnesses. That's actually something that's more um, in these models, actually. You'll see these, the difference between these two different models is actually slightly different amounts of metals. Um, and you can see here that it's 
the, there's a slight difference in how um, basically how bright the star should be for a given mass, depending on what its composition is. But it's much smaller than the age effect, which is still pretty small. You're changing brightness there is not much. Well, if it's for your eclipsing stars, you're changing brightness might be three quarters of it was. Um, uh, it's right there, yeah. So yeah. it's a linear scaling at the bottom, so you uh, have 65 percent. Yeah, this is this is a uh, yeah, this is flux. Uh -huh. Yeah. If the sunspot were to travel across the atmosphere, mm -hmm. you one of your early graphs showed you know a little bit of a noise in there. That's hardly perceivable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the, um, the sun yeah sunspots would be you know a couple percent. Uh, eclipses can be you know fifty percent. Um, but Kepler has the precision; you can see both. <coughs> Sort that out noise. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Kepler, Kepler, you know, knows how much noise it has. Uh, so you have some, you know, we have some idea of what the noise should be, and we can tell that this isn't noise, basically because we, looking at a different star, you get this. Uh, and then, you know, you look at something like this, and you think you can calculate what the noise is for this star. And, yeah, it's much, it's it's much lower than even what. Uh, you know, the the, the signal noise for Kepler is like a couple of thousand to one. Do you have any planets in that system? Would they orbit around the, the center of mass of two stars, or okay, so? Um, depend on how close they well, are. Well, well, no matter no matter what in a system, everything is orbiting around the center of mass. Yeah. Um, there are different ways that you can have a stable orbit of a planet around a binary system. Um, it was generally thought, actually, that the only really stable orbit is you have the two stars fairly far away and one standing very close to one of the stars. Actually, um, my, uh, some, several of my collaborators just recently after this paper was, actually, it was actually before this paper was officially published, um, uh, Jerry and Bill Welch um, just actually recently came out with a paper. Shelf, they discovered a planet orbiting around both of the stars simultaneously. Um, you have two stars that are close together and the planets um, orbiting around both of them, which was had not been you know, the uh, they discovered tattoos in this game. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, it, it, this, this is one of his uh, big goals. He, he always, uh, I, I taught a class on um, binary stars, and I talked to him about how he, wa he wanted to discover tattoos and he had it, and now, now he has. He's very, he's very excited about that. Um, but um, so yeah, so both of those configurations. Uh, this is some actually we thought we had discovered a planet for a little while, um, but then we finally managed to correct that and there's just some, uh, some noise. What's the uh, difference in you know, scale between long period and short period of time? Um, let's see, like, I'm trying to remember what the period of the thing is, and I haven't um, looked at it for a while, so I'm trying to remember that. Uh, this thing had a period rate of 17 days. Um, the short period ones are a few days. But not. Do you know how that relates to the distance? Um, uh, I have the distance here. The distance between these two is 30, about 30, um, uh, so, uh, uh, that's just supposed to be solar radius. Um, it's about 30 times the radius of the sun. Um, is the separation. That's the kind of What's the distance of the star system from Earth? That is a good question. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I remember it offhand. Uh, I don't think it's up here either. Okay. Yeah. How far away the, uh, the star system is from here? I oh. do not remember. You don't remember. It's not in the Milky Way, right? It is in the Milky Way. Oh. Yeah. This is, it's, all, it's, uh, it, it's all looking at. Uh, starts within our, so within our galaxy, um, but I don't have that exact number. Is, is there an optical telescope available that uh, would have enough res resolution? Yeah, yeah um, we actually, we looked, like I said, we looked at, we did some ground-based optical stuff with the one meter telescope at San, Mount Laguna in San Diego, which is a large, you know, it's, 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 I don't, I'm not sure, I don't think you could see it with, you know, most um, amateur telescopes, but with any research telescope, we definitely, um, can see it. Um, see, see it, but be able to resolve. You, you, there are no telescopes that can resolve it as a binary. Um, yeah. It's only, it, we don't have a binary to make that sense.
Now, just one question. It, the, the stars we presume um, an eclipsing binary or coeval, we are only got one at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it, in terms of the, the spectral classes that you've been looking at, you've been going from what, F to M, thereabouts? Or, That's what, yeah. We're and, and that was intentional. Yeah. Now, do we have any sense if there are circumbinary planets around them, would they have come into existence, or is there a theory that they would have come into existence at the time the stars were born, or after the fact, once these two stars stabilized themselves into a uh, well, binary just, orbit? My understanding, and this is not my particular sure. area of expertise, is that they would all be forming up roughly the same area. Um, part of it is actually our understanding, our theoretical understanding of how planets form in general is very um, uh, incomplete at the moment. Um, there's a lot of theories um, that haven't been very good um, uh, tests on them yet. Uh, things like Kepler, which are discovering tons and hundreds and hundreds of planets now, uh, help to test these theories. Um, but my understanding is that the, the thought should be that they all form at roughly the same time period. The star forms a little bit earlier. Um, and basically, you need the star to form and cool down enough that the planets can then form. Um, but they should form pretty much uh, soon after the star. Yeah, how old are these types of stars typically? How late? Oh, in other words, you know, oval shape uh, yeah. because they are rotating more gravitational interactions between um, two so, stars. So again, actually, that's something that ELC does take into account, the fact that the two stars are rotating and they're close together. They're not perfectly spherical. These two are very, very close to perfectly spherical. They're small, but they're, they're both very far. They're, they're, they're one of the things we're looking at, we're looking at pulp stars that are far enough away that they are no significant um, completeness. Do the stars tend to move away from each other, or are they um, With two stars, the, the orbit is going to be stable, so they will make the exact same orbit over and over and over again without getting further away or closer. Are they moving away from us, or are they... Um, as, as you mentioned, the, the blue light and the red light, and I, I read somewhere that you know, stars are always moving away from each other. Okay. And you said that, you know, um, we always see the red, that's all it's kind of... So, what you're talking about, what you, what you probably heard about is redshift. It's actually galaxies are always involved. Okay, so that's, that's why it's inside the Milky Way, so... Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, basically what, what, what that is, is the universe itself is expanding. And at a very large scale, as a gal looking at other galaxies, that expansion basically overwhelms whatever motion the actual galaxy has. So some galaxies might happen to be moving towards us, but the universe is expanding faster, so overall they're oh. moving away from us. On the scale of stars within our solar system, that expansion basically is essentially neg negligible. Mm -hmm. um, and so even so between galaxies within the group, is really the Yeah, yeah. And for example, Andromeda is the closest major galaxy to us is actually moving towards us. Um, it's really you only see it in a red light. Um, well, so you see it in all lights. What it is is. What it, what, what, so what it is with these uh, shift things is that there are these, and I think I can say that So there's these lines, and <laughs> you know what wavelength those lines are intrinsically, because it has to do with basically chemistry. Uh, so this line uh, is probably um, hydrogen alpha, it's one particular hydrogen line. And we know from studying hydrogen here on Earth that it has a wavelength of 656, uh, six, 6,563 angstroms, um, you know, exactly. So we observe it, and actually here I notice that the center is actually a little bit less than 656. So this whole system is actually being shifted to uh, 655. So it's a little bit shorter wavelength. So this whole system is actually moving towards us. Plus, then it gets fledged, so we can tell within the system one of the stars is moving towards us or away from us. So one of the things you do with the ground-based spectroscopy with the binary, the first thing you do is you figure out what the overall shift of the system is, and you subtract it out and ignore the rest of the research. But it is a first step. Because you're not doing spectroscopy on it anyway. Well, we, we did do some ground-based spectroscopy. You need to have that as Just part of the first track, right? Right, right. right. To, to get stuff about the mass, you need to have some spectroscopy. So actually, in, I think in this pit, I guess this is just, but uh, you actually do, uh, from the uh, radial velocity here, this is from spectroscopy. This, uh, this is spectroscopy, this is from Kepler, or this is from Kepler, and this is again. 
from our visitor guide that is visual. So, so with close uh, clips of these binaries, you do get tidal force uh, uh, that that will cause the orbit of the of the two uh, stars to change. Algol is a lot slower now than it was in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get tidal force that slows the orbit, but it actually, but it makes the stars spin faster. So the orbit that they they used to orbit, you know, every you know one day. Now they orbit every two days. But if you start, the star spins on its axis once every two days, where earlier it might have spun on its axis once every, you know, the sun spins on its axis once every 30 days. So, you know, just like the Earth spins on its axis once a day. Um, because the distance in between the two uh, stars changes. Yes, yes, that's true. There, there is a little bit of, like, I, I guess I had said earlier that the thing Over the period of your observation? Huh? It's changing over the period of your observation? No, no. I mean, we observed for four years. This is something, you know, I've heard, you know, a peak of second year or something. I'm not sure. So even if, even if they haven't stabilized into that synchronous time. Right. Yeah. And actually, the further away they are, the, the weaker the tidal forces are, so the less significant that is. And we're again trying to look for stars that are relatively far away from each other. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for coming out. And thanks to all of you.